Hello and welcome to another live stream event with Howard Bachner. I am Howard Bachner and this is Conversations with Dr. Bachner. I'm joined today by Rochelle Walensky, who's going to be discussing her viewpoint, which is entitled From Mitigation to Containment of the COVID-19 Pandemic, Putting the SARS-CoV-2 Genie Back in the Bottle. Welcome, Rochelle. Hey, thanks for having me. So Rochelle is Chief, the Division of Infectious Diseases at Mass General Hospital and a Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, Rochelle's uh, co-author on the paper is Carlos Del Rio, who's written quite a bit for us on this issue with uh, Preeti Milani. And this uh, viewpoint initiates a new series for us entitled uh, COVID-19 Beyond Tomorrow. I, I wanted to name it COVID-19, uh, the sequel, but was persuaded not to by a number of people, uh, uh, in part because sequels sometimes are good and sometimes not so good. Um, the paper, <laughs> the viewpoint was released on Friday and was accompanied by an editorial that Phil Fontana Rose and I, I wrote um, entitled COVID-19, Looking Beyond Tomorrow for Healthcare and Society. Uh, Rochelle's piece is the first, we think, one of the most important. Uh, next week uh, on Monday, we'll be publishing a piece by Sherry Gleed, the following week by Don Berwick, and these will roll out over the next uh, six to eight weeks. So, R Rochelle, um, before we start, um, I know you're a clinician, you're caring for patients. Uh, what's it been like at Mass General the last few weeks? Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me and thank you for publishing our work. Um, you know, uh, we're pretty knee deep in the thick of it. Um, but, uh, Massachusetts is third to New York and New Jersey in terms of states with disease. We have about 38,000 uh, patients in Massachusetts um, and about 1,700 deaths. Um, we're ticking away deaths at around 150, 170 a day. Um, at Mass General, I think we have the largest um, number of patients in the state. I think we have actually about 12% of all patients in the state with disease. Um, latest counts this morning were about 340 patients with COVID, about another other hundred that are ruling out. And um, interestingly, over the last two weeks or so, we've seen more and more of those patients intubated and in the intensive care unit. So we have about um, 167 patients in our ICUs now, and over 90% of them are um, intubated. Has the course been similar to what other people have described? You know, it, there's been some variability, but one that it's longer. People are being intubated for a longer period of time. Uh, proning seems to really help. Uh, there's been some descriptions of the patient who is not in the intensive care unit doing well and then rapidly declines. I, I, I don't know if that's going to hold the test of time, but, but your clinical sense of the patients and how long they're being intubated, uh, respiratory oxygen needs... Yeah, there, I think um, it's really been by phasic. There are some people who can come off in a couple of days, but I think that for the most part, people are staying on the vent for a longer period of time, which is probably why we've seen this rap this rise in the fraction of our patients who are ventilated. It is true that we do see these, um, we, first of all, we also have a proning team. Um, we have a team that goes around and mm. prones patients who are intubated, but also patients who are not intubated. Um, and that seems to have been been helping actually. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, we do see this sort of rapid deterioration. We have an epic worksheet now that's sort of what we're calling our COVID work that we are following the COVID lab. So we can sort of see all the things that we're looking at, be it the CKs or the ferritins or the troponins or the, um, or the CRPs, the D-dimers and whatnot, all in one space, the LFTs and whatnot. And um, yeah, we do see some patients where you sort of have this feeling of impending doom as they're coming into their, you see their labs just go in the wrong direction. All right. Um, thank you for the clinical update. But uh, the subtitle uh, is uh, mm -hmm. Genie Back in the Bottle. A lot, right. of, lot of modeling over the last couple of weeks, a lot of articles about how much testing uh, needs to go on. Um, le let's start by the due two different tests. We have the traditional test for whether or not you're acutely infected, but that's just over the last week, the entire issue of serology has emerged. So could you explain the difference between the tests and what do people mean by serology? 
So um, the test that we are talking about when we talk about these NP swabs, these nasopharyngeal swabs, that um, you put the swab in your nose and you get a sample from the back of your nar- from the back of your nasopharynx, um, that's testing for virus. It's testing. It's an RT PCR. It's a reverse transcript based PCR that tests for um, the the amount of virus or virus that you might have there. Um, early studies de- um, said that this was about 70% sensitive. Um, and so that has become a real challenge. We think it's actually pretty specific. We think for the most part that people who have a positive test probably do have disease. Um, although I think part of the challenge with this test early on was it was probably contaminated and that probably is because it's a PCR and easy to get contaminated. Um, the sensitivity of this test is has been a real challenge because yeah. you really, on the one hand, you really want to know who has the disease, but really from infection control and truly PPE purposes, you'd really like, like to definitively know who doesn't because um, especially in the context of is there asymptomatic transmission and are people shedding virus when they may not have symptoms, if you can't believe your negative test, you really don't know when to take people off precautions. And that's been a real challenge in the hospital. So um, this test early on took a few days to get back. We now have tests at Mass General where we can get back results in a few hours, although those are limited. Um, most of our testing capacity is having those tests come back in eight to 10 hours. But again, um, if somebody comes in with signs and symptoms that could be COVID or an exposure or a travel history or something that could be COVID and they have a negative test, we don't feel confident that they can necessarily come off precautions. And so we are um, retesting them following their clinical course. So that is the RT-PCR that tests for virus. And that group, the other, that, far, just to intru- that group of patients would be cohorted with uh, COVID-19 patients until you, until you got a second test. Actually, what we're doing is we have COVID-19 confirmed. We have kind of COVID risk floors. Got it. And then after they're ruled out or ruled in, we shuttle them. You move them um, but they way. Yeah, which is a real operational challenge as well, right? As you can imagine, there's a lot of moving going on. All right, all right. Let's go to the serology uh, tests. So the serology tests for antibody, and that is um, early on. We believe so. In in general, we believe that your virus comes down when your antibody comes up, right? So you by seven days, we hope to see IgM. By ten days, we hope to see IgG. And in theory, we should be able to see virus coming down as we see antibody escalating. Um, some of the challenges were that with this test are I've read about a third of patients who have disease don't get antibody. So there are some people who we know had disease who don't get antibody. There are also a lot of people who probably have antibody who never had confirmed disease. And so we're, we're really, there are a lot of antibody tests out there now. The FDA has actually said that people can use these tests not necessarily without an emergency use authorization. So there are a lot of them and we really have to understand how they work and we don't really yet. So if you were to screen somebody in the community who had a positive IgM, um, should you be concerned that they're probably still shedding virus? Maybe. Um, what if they had an IgM and an IgG? Maybe. What if they just had an IgG? We don't know. Um, The other thing we don't know about this antibody test is, does it mean that you can't get it again? And um, there's a real, real um, uncertainty about that. We know everybody is hoping that the antibody means I've had it before, phew, I'm not going to get it again, I'm not at risk. But I don't think we know that yet. Um, we know from early studies in macaques, several small studies in macaques, that when they've been rechallenged, they didn't get it again. Um, but there are data from South Korea now that actually um, say that some of their patients have gotten it again. Um, not clear that they ever confirmed that they ever. Um, got rid of the virus to begin with, but people who were positive IgG, who they thought were better, now had virus detectable again. Well, one, there's a lot. I I appreciate you saying uh, uh, that there's a great deal of uncertainty. I I, I am concerned that we're often suggesting that these models are perfect, or if we had this number of tests, we'd know for sure. And I I worry that that if that that ends up not being true, I I think it, it then creates a dynamic about what are researchers and scientists saying that the public can can believe? So I really appreciate you saying there's much still un, un, unknown. Yes. So, you know, the, the tagline is genie back in the bottle. That's what everyone wants to know. Um, 
you know, it's 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 being discussed on the front page of every newspaper. Uh, I don't watch TV, but I am told on every TV show. Um, what what what's your sense of what we really need to do to think about beginning to return to some normalcy over the next few weeks, over the next few months, and this series is really focused on the fall. I've said that to all the people writing for us. And the reason is schools are going to be closed likely throughout the country through the end of, uh, through the, end of the school year. Some may reopen, but not many. People de- tend to take vacations in the summer. Most summer school programs have all changed if they're going to exist at all. So then in the fall, we get to school, we get to college, people return from vacation. So the focus for this series is on uh, on on the next few months, but really the fall. So how do how do we get back to some form of normalcy in, in late August or September? Right. So I think you know I we the byline is genie back in the bottle, but we started with from mitigation back to containment. All right. So, so why don't you talk and, about that? So yeah. So if we um. To the, the countries that did this so well didn't get community spread. So why didn't they get community spread? It's because anybody who they thought might have disease, they tested and isolated and contacted all of the people they were in contact with, quarantined and tested them, and just sort of made sure that every single individual who they thought was at risk um, or potentially had disease, got tested quickly. And that was, those were countries like South Korea. That's who did that well. Um, so for those who, you know, who were unable to do that well, they were not, they were simply not testing enough. And so I think if we are, and so those are, you know, when you move from contagion stra- containment strategies, which is testing and isolation, to mitigation strategies, which are all the things that we are doing and not liking. We are washing our hands a lot and social distancing and not traveling. All of those things are mitigation strategies because we have community spread. So if we are going to move backwards from mitigation to containment, we have to be able to test a lot of people so that those people who we can, um, who we think might have disease, we isolate and contact trace. Now, um, one of the statistics I think was really interesting is how do you know you're testing enough people? Well, you probably know because you're not finding very much disease, right? In Massachusetts, the last numbers we had, 25% of people we tested were positive. That means we have an extraordinary high pre-test probability of having disease when we put when we test people. And that's really just because we don't have capacity to test more. South Korea, they have 3% positive rate. So they're testing so many people that only 3% of them are positive. And people have actually estimated that we are testing about a third to tenfold too few people, three times to tenfold too few people. And that those statistics would actually argue in that direction. So I think we need to have so much testing that we, we can identify these people and contain the disease. And by testing, you don't mean serology. You mean testing for acute infection. I just want to be careful because yeah. serology's emerged in the last week. I want to make sure we differentiate between the two. Absolutely. This is the NP swab that I'm talking about, right. like to really test. Now, there have been actually papers that were published out of science that actually have said, not only do we need to test, Testing's not enough. Um, I've done a lot of work in testing in my career. We know that testing is only as good as the information you do with it. So um, you've got to test people. In an ideal world, they wouldn't wait 24 hours for that test and roam around. You would test them immediately. We don't have any tests that can do that, give you results immediately, although the Cepheid test can give you results in a couple of hours. You test them. You give them the results, and some studies actually suggest you have to contact trace all of their contacts within yeah. 24 hours in order to really narrow down the number of people who could potentially be contacting other people and passing the disease along. Um, Rochelle, so uh, this has been a struggle since January. I, I mean, I, I've said publicly the, the greatest challenge and probably the single greatest tragedy has been the testing problems in the United States. Um, It's just led to logistical and organizational nightmares. And then the other is what I, I, I believe is was slow recognition of asymptomatic spread and what we should do about that. But let's put that as an aside. Do you actually think we could get there with testing in the United States, given what's happened and what, what you know of, of what we need to do to get to that type of testing where 
You can get it in a grocery store. You can get it at a drug store. It's inexpensive. You, you know, p families want to get together. They quarantine their significant other, their spouses, their children. It, it would totally change the way we think of contact if you could get a, a, a test very quickly and it was negative. Even if it was three hours, it would really change. Do you think we can get there in the next couple months? Um, I'm an optimistic person at baseline, so I'm going to say it's possible. You know, we I, I remind people, um, we didn't know about this disease on December 30th. And we have like numerous tests, numerous trials going on. We've done an extraordinary amount in a relatively short period of time. I also would say that we have a lot of clinical tests out there that we do. I mean, Dexy sticks, we do four times a day, right? So it's there are tests that we can do right now. This one's more complicated. It's not a sugar on a blood stick. But, you know, there are ways that we, I think, can fundamentally change how there are rapid antibody tests that are coming up. There are rapid things that are emerging. Um, there are folks that are looking at whether um, you can actually, instead of doing a nasal swab and doing a nasopharyngeal swab, simply do a nasal swab. That would potentially allow people to test themselves right um, I, I'm not sure we can get there by June. I'd like to hope we can get there by June and um, or July. And um, what I would say is if we're not there, we have to be really cautious about how we think about what the next steps look like. Right. And I just want to reiterate that you said that's part one of what the strategy would be to move um, to, to move from mitigation back to quarantine. Um, you know, it's t test, track, trace and quarantine that goes together. So so it's not just testing. You, you've written about a few other things in the viewpoint. You want to talk about them? Yeah, the, the one thing I really want to highlight is the issue around vulnerable populations. So this, this disease, I think, came to the United States um, via people who traveled and potentially people who cruised. And like many other epi uh, infectious diseases, it starts in certain populations, but most of these or many of these diseases end in vulnerable populations and really sort of, um, I wouldn't say end, but they, they do find a way to really vulnerable populations that, that really um, are much more over overrepresented in the number of people who they ultimately affect. Um, this is this disease is it doesn't have it doesn't have walls right um, so so how we treat our vulnerable populations and how we take care of them will have direct impact as to how much is in the community um, if we sort of say to people who test when you test we're going to isolate you and quarantine you and not let you go back to work they will not test if you are going to take away their livelihood and take them away from their families potentially or not or or they don't have places to go. So they might, in fact, not test and then go work on the subway or go work in the restaurant and and ignore the symptoms that they're having. So it really it is beholden on us to be able to make sure that we are treating these populations properly as we roll out all of the um, uh, all of the things that need to be done here. You know, you can't tell somebody who is uh, living in an apartment with seven people who needs to go to work in order to pay that, you know, utility bill that we're going to test you and then go isolate at home. Don't, you know, have contact with your family members and don't work. How are we going to handle that as a society? Yeah, Clyde Yancey wrote in our pages last week, um, I think the, the quote is, social distancing is a privilege. And he could certainly say being able to be quarantined is a privilege. Uh, it's, it's complicated to do if your family is reliant on an individual's income. Uh, quarantine or social distancing uh, becomes very, very difficult for, for people to do. Um, what about social distancing? What's that look like going forward for us? Um, I think it's going to be different depending on where you are in the country. Um, I try and say at my dinner table not to have people get too, um, not to have anybody have their heart set on too much right now. I think 
first thing we have to recognize is like big crowds in terms of, um, you know, baseball games, Mardi Gras, festivals, those things are probably not a good idea. And um, I hope the leadership will really understand the risks and benefits of having those events um, in the near future, at least until we really recognize that we have this under control, that there's really widespread testing. I think those are really quite dangerous at this point. Um, what does distancing look like? I think we're all going to be wearing masks for a while, um, or I'd like to think we're all going to be wearing masks for a while. I think um, maybe we will be going back to schools at half capacity. Maybe certain grades will go back on certain days or certain, uh, you know, in the fall. I don't. Th I think you're right that school probably for this year is over. Um, it's not quite yet in Massachusetts, but I would bet that that's probably where we're heading. Um, Workplaces, I think, are going to be the same that, you know, maybe people work every other week or every other day um, so that we can really just keep the crowds down. What does it mean to, for retail? What does it mean for restaurants? Um, I, you know, I am very much interested in having the economy get back to, back on its feet again, but not at the risk of public health. Um, and so I think if we look at the 1918 flu and what happened there, countries that did are areas that did public health well fared very much better than those that didn't. Um, so I, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the restaurant industry in the months ahead. I have been trying to support takeout for, for numerous reasons, um, but I, I do think we're going to all, you know, crowded restaurants, I think, are, should be a thing of the past for a little while. One of the issues that, you know, I, I, I have I said during the grand rounds that I did at your, your place with a few other people, you know, the volume of content that I get a chance to read every day, which for me is actually a privilege because it gives me an extraordinary sense of the different issues that are emerging. And one of the issues that's come across my just just in the last few days is the notion of a mask versus a shield. It's, it's very interesting in that there may be some benefits to the shield versus the mask. One, if you're wearing a mask, hearing impaired people, if, if work begins in any capacity, he hearing impaired people can't, can't, um, uh, can't uh, understand you. And mm -hmm. that the shield also protects your eyes. And there's been some question about whether or not that's important. Do you have any sense about a mask or a shield? Um, I think it depends on how far. I, I um, am pretty sensitive to the hearing loss issues, actually. So um, I, I think it does depend on um, how close you are to people, um, how those shields are, shields are fancy. It's certainly, it's easier to make a home mask than a home shield, right? right? Um, so I, all of this is going to be about implementation. You know, I think we really, I think part of the expectation of what the next steps are is sort of the emotional expectation. Um, if we sort of emotionally agree that we are all going to be in a place where we want to go to the market, we want to go to the mall, um, but we're going to wear masks. And because we're going to do that, I will protect you by wearing a mask. You will protect me by wearing a mask, right? We're not protecting ourselves. Um, if we're all sort of in that together, then I think it's probably going to be a lot easier to tolerate other things, right? Um, but in terms... I do agree, like we obviously are using masks for mu mucous membrane spread, but if you're going to stay six feet apart, then I think it's probably okay. Um, I want to return to the serology question. You, you outlined that there's much unknown. Um, you know, when do people develop IgG or IgM? Uh, if they have IgM, if we can eventually detect IgG um, to coronavirus, does it mean, in fact, that they were infected? How long does it last? I mean, I know in conversations I've had previously, there's some data from SARS that it actually lasts a fair amount. What percent of people have a robust response versus not having a ro ro robust response? We don't have those data. Those data will emerge, I'm confident, pretty quickly um, from, right. from Europe and the United States if they don't arrive from Korea and China and some other countries. I, I actually think we will know a great deal more about that in the next month to six weeks. Let's say we do have serology testing, and we do know that you know a certain IgG level does seem to suggest neutralizing antibodies. I, I've said it would be great information. Uh, I know a country like Germany is planning to try to obtain that information on virtually their entire citizenship. We probably can't do that. They have a population of 80 million. We have a population of 320 or 325 million. 
But say for schools or colleges or healthcare or grocery stores, how could you imagine using that information? Right. So this, well, I think what you're getting at is herd immunity. So let's let's hope and pretend right now that um, we believe that if you have antibody, that that'll bridge you to the vaccine that we all hope will be here in a year and a half. Okay. So if we could sort of get to that sense, then the question is, how much of the population do we really need to be have been infected before we start feeling like we can stand behind a little bit of herd immunity? Um, that relates to a, an epidemiologic term called the are not, um, which is how infectious. One of the questions. So go ahead. <laughs> okay. So the are not is um, an epidemiologic term that is, if you took an infected person and put them in a completely susceptible population, there was no immunity at all. How many people would get infected? Um, the highest number I've seen is for measles. That number is about 17 or 18. For for flu, the number is around one to one and one point four, I believe, is what they generally say for flu. And they generally say for epidemics that if your R naught is one, your epidemic is in steady state, and you really need your R naught to be less than one for your epidemic to decline. Um, so the projections or the thought about the R naught for um, for SARS CoV two is that it's somewhere around two to three. Um, that it, we would infect two or three more people if you were in a completely susceptible population. I have seen estimates more recently that it could be as high as five or six, but let's pretend right now it's two or three. Um, so your your herd immunity is, um, you can calculate your herd immunity by having an R naught. So it's one minus one over the R naught. So if we're, if uh, your R naught is like two- I like that, Jabur. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's how, I like that, I like that. Go ahead. <laughs> So your herd immunity is probably 50%, and if it's three, it's probably 66%. So we need to sort of use, we can use the serology information to understand if we're at 10% infected or history of infection, we're probably not anywhere close, and we're still going to get these spikes of disease. If we're at 50 or 60 percent, and that happened because there was a lot of asymptomatic spread out there, and maybe we could hope, and all those people are protected, then maybe we're at a place where we can um, just rest a little easier that that not everybody who's in contact you're in contact with is potentially susceptible to disease. Now, one of the things that's unique about the United States, it's 50 states, it's the District of Columbia, it's Puerto Rico, and the amount of disease is hugely, hugely variable. I look at the numbers uh, uh, every day. Um, it's amazing how little disease there is in certain states. Uh, most urban centers in the U.S. have, have really done well. I think people describe Boston as the current hotspot with New York having managed and being past the worst, but Philly, Pittsburgh, you know, throughout the South, uh, even New Orleans is managing. Detroit is better than it had been, but it's really variable. So how, how do you think of um, testing and serology given that the amount of disease is so variable in the country? Right. Well, so I think, you know, <laughs> my, my favorite quote about, about sort of opening up different pieces and having having everybody work on a different uh, plane here was from my co-author, Carlos Del Rio, who sort of said, opening up pieces of the country is like having a peeing section to the swimming pool. <laughs> so it, it makes it very, I mean, we have very fluid borders, right? And so I would say how, how well you do will depend on how how people comply with stay-at-home orders um, while we still have them, and then how much testing is out there. Um, and if sections are testing and they can sort of get people back under, you know, isolated when they need to and not on airplanes. Um, but, you know, you know, and why is Boston doing not as well as Detroit did? I, I don't know the answer to that, except that maybe there was more community spread. We do know that we had a meeting here, the, the famous Biogen meeting here, where there were a lot of cases and a lot of community spread before we could really do any testing. But I do think that all, all paths kind of lead to the testing pathway. Yeah, it was interesting, uh, your, your comment about travel. When I interviewed Mike Levitt, the former governor of Utah and head of HHS, he said he could imagine in the fall, when we get back to some normalcy, 
that that travel will come with warning signs and it'll be it's like the fire in the summer you'll go from a one to a five and that you know there'll be certain communities that will be a five and you know you may want to restrict travel to those places until you understand how well they're doing um, because because of the unknown i thought i thought it was an interesting concept that that it really may vary and it may vary both around the world as well as around the country and I think we should expect that we may be in these staccato situation, right? So we may open again and and or open to a new space, whatever that looks like, a new kind of normal, whatever that looks like. And then we may see these um these swelling, this swelling of new admissions coming into the hospital, this you know, all much of people coming in with COVID nineteen, and we may have to go back and restrict again. And so it may be this staccato of sort of letting go a little bit, restricting a little bit, letting go a little bit until we get to some level of herd immunity. Right. That's what Carlos and Preeti had described in their, in their previous uh, cl clinical update. And I, I do appreciate that you use the word may because there's so much unknown. A couple other questions. Um, it has been striking about the variability around the U.S. There may be different reasons for it. But we know from the history of flu, and sometimes we like the comparison to flu, other times we don't <laughs> like the comparison to flu. And sometimes they're good, sometimes they don't work as well because uh, children get flu and uh, children generally do not get this disease. So in that regards, it's very different. Um, you know, we know that in general, flu uh, varies and it usually wanes with warm weather. Do you have any sense about whether or not that's happening with this virus or uh, it's just so unclear? Yeah, we don't know. But here's what I can tell you. I okay. think um, part of the reason that flu, there are many things that help flu wane with warm weather. Respiratory viruses generally don't do as well in warm weather, um, partially because of the humidity, it drops the virus to the floor, right? So it can't sort of hang out in the air. Um, but the, and the other thing is like when there's herd immunity, it's harder for the virus to get around. And we also know that, you know, 40 to 50% of Americans get vaccinated with flu. Um, so the herd immunity and the, the fact that the conditions aren't quite as good for the virus, that on top of the fact that there's research that suggests that our immune systems are a little bit better over the summer. So that may sort of help flu uh, sort of diminish in the summer months. Most coronaviruses also diminish in the summer right. months. Um, so it could very well be that this will diminish or and, and and on top of that, everybody's outside. Right. So there are people outside and they're not crowding in movie theaters and they're not doing all the indoor things that people do that help transmit this. So we have a lot of factors that will decrease the transmission of this virus just by virtue of the fact that it's summertime, which is great. Do we know whether this virus isn't going to transmit over the summer? I don't think we do. Do I expect that we'll see cases over the summer? I think we will. And then uh, comes to the fall when flu begins again, but that that didn't happen that much with SARS. Now there's a, there's other reasons why it didn't happen as much with SARS. Um, do do you think uh, COVID nineteen is going to behave more like flu or more like SARS? I think you know I've heard people say that you know you call it cold and flu season that we are for the next bit of time going to be calling it flu, cold, and COVID season. Okay. And it will probably get challenging, even more challenging, right? Because fortunately now, most people who come in with disease probably come in with COVID and not flu. Come December, um, people are going to come in and we're not going to know what they have, right? Um, and so that's where you really hope that there, we have really great tests to help distinguish between them. Yeah, I, I've commented. I wish it was like a pregnancy test. You can go anywhere, buy it you know, uh, test some some fluid and know if it's positive or negative and it would cost 20 bucks so anyone could do it. Because it also exactly. just rearranges how, how families visit. Like my son was in New York and he was coming to visit me. This was four weeks ago and he was worried that he, he didn't really want to come and see me if, he, if I didn't want him to because he was concerned. Theoretically, if he came and visited and we could test him, we'd know right away, theoretically, he was negative and, and you could... Right reunite families in a way that's not possible now. A lot of the same questions that when I interviewed Tony or I, I interviewed Carlos, but I'll go over them because they come up uh, all the time. Um, we started with talking about the sensitivity um, yeah. and it, it's complicated if it's early in the disease. So one was the swab obtained correctly. How, 
the quality of the test, and then is it is it possible to be negative early in the disease? Um, a, a sense of is it, um, you know, most of the people I've spoken to are still thinking it's in the 90s, it, it, if, particularly if people are not coming to the hospital with disease. That may not be true in the asymptomatic period when, when, when you're initially infected. Can you say anything more about it? There's quite a few questions about this. Yeah, I think there's, this is really hard, right? So people who are walking around feeling okay, maybe have some symptoms, you do the test. And there, I think we should actually distinguish between did you get a good sample right. and how did the test perform? So let's presume right now you got a good sample because not all of them are good samples. I don't know if you've seen, like, you have to get, like, you have to go pretty far seen, back. Yeah, I have seen it. Well, so you have to go pretty far back. So let's pretend the sample is actually adequate. Early in disease, you may not have enough virus there. Right. Right. There just may not be enough virus to sort of say you came in, you had mild symptoms, there wasn't enough virus to detect. It could be wrong that way. Um, middle of disease, let's say maybe there is enough virus and you're actually in the people are saying now about 2.3 days before you get symptoms is really where virus is starting to peak. So maybe you're getting it just when you have a lot of virus. The other thing happens at the sort of as you get sicker. So what we have found is that people are actually losing virus in their nasopharynx and it's moving down into their, their chest. So we have quite a few situations, um, not, not, you know, high percentages, but definitely many cases where people looked so much like they had COVID that we, even with a hundred negative tests, we were never going to take right. them off precautions. They come in, they had a negative test, negative nasopharyngeal swab, a second nasopharyngeal swab. They ultimately went to the ICU, got intubated. We get a deep bronchial specimen and that's positive. Yeah. So it, it, it's migrating. All right. A couple other questions. Um, this comes up all the time, uh, I think in part because of some papers in JAMA New England Journal um, uh, spread by droplets, sp spread by uh, aer aerosolization. We published the paper from MIT that, that says if you cough or sneeze, it goes a long distance and that uh, this kind of six foot is really old data based upon size of droplet. Anything new about this kind of droplet aerosolization spread? Um, this is, <laughs> for those of us who don't do infection control for their career, <laughs> right. this, has been, this has been really challenging. I think generally people think it's droplet. Um, that By the way, I don't like the, these terms because these terms can be yeah, confusing, I, I have to say, but keep going. Right. So droplet is um, those things that, you know, this, the, the, from the sneeze, they, they don't travel. They fall as soon as <laughs> they, 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 they are spewed. Okay. Right, exactly. The aerosolized is um, really like less than five microns and it kind of hangs out in the air. Now this is both about an aerosolized and what we think about things like tuberculosis, right, right. is that it hangs out in the air both in time and space. So it travels and, you know, if you left the room and somebody else came in, it could still be there. And so I don't think of it in the same sort of way that TB aerosolizes, but I do believe you can find it in microns. It probably doesn't hang out in time and space and it probably doesn't travel much, but I do believe there's aerosol there. Oh, I like that term time and space. It felt like I was in a different world. Um, um, <laughs> we like to be sometimes. <laughs> R naught, does R naught? Uh, change over time? Um, epi purely epidemiologically, no, because its definition is that if you put a single person into a completely susceptible community, um, that that's what R naught is, right? So, so by definition, it shouldn't change. However, um, as the community becomes less and less susceptible, then the number of people you could potentially transmit to, uh, that is, as people potentially get antibody that protects them from infection again, then um, the transmission certainly would go down. Okay. I, I do want to make the point that Michael Natich already says hello to you, but you've already answered his oh. question. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, last question, then we'll stop. Um, uh, if one does develop immunity based upon, we don't know in this disease, but based upon other uh, uh, coronavirus infections, how long should it last? 
Um, we don't know. Uh, you know, kids can get reinfected with coronaviruses after years. Um, so, you know, I am hopeful it will uh, last long enough to get us to a vaccine. And I think that's actually the best we could hope for. Yeah. And I, I will ask one last question. Um, you know, I, I spoke to Greg Poland a few weeks ago, and I may I'm, I may talk to Greg again because he's such a vaccine expert. You know, I, you know, Tony's been on a few times. Tony's more more reserved about vaccines. Since he's been around for 40 years, I would tend to trust him and his comments about vaccines. <laughs> um, you know, people are really, uh, some people are optimistic about moving to much, uh, much larger, much uh, stronger or larger large scale studies in the fall, uh, much sooner. Um, a number of people have, have described a uh, trying to move the vaccine through our processes in a different way than it's been done before. Do you have any any sense of, on vaccine development? Um, you know, on the one hand, dire times require dire measures, right? So we, I think we would call this dire times. And so I would be in favor of trying to move things quickly forward. On the other hand, um, I, you know, in my other life, I'm an HIV researcher, and so we've we've been disappointed in the HIV world with vaccines. So, so I, I, while I want to be cautiously optimistic, and I know there are some excellent candidates out there, um, the the, you know, we may be disappointed. I sure hope we're not, but we may be disappointed that, and we can't put all of our eggs in one vac vaccine basket, right? Because these have been developed extraordinarily quickly. And so all of this should be, there may be a vaccine. Right. I mean, it's, in, it's interesting. Again, I'm, I, I'm hoping that the research and scientific community can be careful with language. Um, therapies for coronavirus, and we should begin to see the results of some clinical trials in the next few weeks, will not be cures. And they're likely to have number needed to treat of 10 or 15 or 20. Uh, I have seen data on what's being measured as an outcome. Uh, very, f <laughs> uh, very, few are, very few are around case fatality rates. Now, it would be really nice to keep someone off a ventilator or for them to be on a ventilator for half the amount of time. Um, but none of these therapies are going to have a low number needed to treat. That would be incredibly unusual. So we, I, I think, just need to be careful about language. And one of the things I think that has been telling from I, my point of view, and I haven't seen some of the, the papers that you have, um, is, uh, you know, trials started enrolling in China in early February. And um, many of these had DSMBs, many of these had ways of measuring these things. If we thought there was something that was really amazing out there that was really going to save lives, I would have thought we'd know about it by now. Right. The, the, the other thing is the disease isn't the same thing in all patients. So there may be, we're going to need more research to understand the match between specific treatments and certain patients. It, it, it again, and we're, we're always anxious about subgroup analysis and randomized clinical trials, but it, it's clear that uh, a number of patients or a large percent have inflammatory cascades. Well, they may need a different treatment than with an antiviral agent. The, the other is um, I, get, I get anxious about thinking of vaccines as cures because if it's a vaccine that behaves like it does to flu, sometimes, sometimes a vaccine, the yearly developed flu vaccine is not that effective. So again, sometimes we like the comparison to flu, but other times it, uh, we may not want the comparison to flu to hold because you know better than I that flu vaccines vary in their effectiveness. Well, and it may it may be that this just attenuates disease. It may be that the vaccine attenuates disease. And you know what? That would be okay right now, right? <laughs> um, we, we'd be okay with that. But your point is well taken. And, and the other question is not just what therapy should we give for a patient who is has this manifestation of disease or that manifestation of disease, but what stage should we give it in? What are the ones that we should be giving as an outpatient? What are the ones we should be giving in the ICU? This is Howard Bachner, uh, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA. This has been Conversations with Dr. Bachner Rochelle. This has been one of the most pleasant conversations. And <laughs> M Michael Berkowitz, the digital editor, this is a serious issue for the U.S., People are dying, but it's nice to have a pleasant conversation with someone who's reassuring and so knowledgeable. 
Rochelle uh, is chief of the Division of Infectious Diseases at Massachusetts General Hospital and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Rochelle, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Stay healthy and uh, wish all the uh, other coworkers uh, good, good tidings. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.